So we talked a little bit about photosynthesis so far. Um, we're going to do the reaction again, and we're going to talk about what's getting oxidized and what's getting reduced. Um, typically, when we think about photosynthesis, we think about plants, right? That plants are those that go that undergo photosynthesis. But um, also, algae are able to photosynthesize. And there are some bacteria called cyanobacteria that actually undergo photosynthesis. What produces the energy? Well, it's sunlight, right? The energy that drives this process is sunlight. And then we'll look, we'll look at the chloroplast, the structure of the chloroplast. But let's just go through the reaction quickly. So photosynthesis, as mentioned before, it's six CO2 plus six water, and I'm going to put this coming in like this, okay? Sunlight is the energy that's driving this reaction. Yields glucose plus oxygen gas, six of them, okay? Now, this is also a redox reaction, meaning that one molecule is getting reduced while another molecule is getting oxidized. So let's follow. This is carbon-containing molecule. This one's carbon-containing. That means water must be being converted into oxygen gas. All right. Reduction means gain electrons, or we can follow the hydrogens, gain hydrogens. So certainly carbon dioxide is becoming reduced because it's got, we've got a lot of hydrogens here. Water is losing hydrogens or losing electrons, so it is being oxidized. Okay. Um, one thing that we mentioned previously in the semester was an endergonic and an exergonic reaction. So this would be an endergonic reaction because it requires an input of energy, input of sunlight. Cellular respiration would be an exergonic reaction because we get a release of energy, right? We're producing ATP through that process. All right, let's look at the chloroplast. So cellular respiration, we associate with the mitochondria. Um, photosynthesis, we are, um, should associate with the chloroplast. Now, chloroplast has a double membrane. So we see there's an outer membrane and an inner membrane. But then we have interior to that these little discs, right, that are called thylakoids or thylakoid discs. And a full stack of these discs is called granum, okay? The cell or the liquid that's in between the grana is called stroma. And what I want you to notice is that the discs are green in color, and they truly are green. This is what gives plants their green color. And they're green because of the chlorophyll pigment. So plants have chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B, and they are embedded in the thylakoid membranes. That means the thylakoid membrane okay, is where the light reactions are happening. The light reactions we'll talk about in a minute. This is where the sunlight is being um, harnessed, right? The energy from the sun is being harnessed, um, and therefore it's, it's the, the pigments are necessary because they are going to absorb this light energy. So light reactions occur in the thylakoid on, in the membrane. The Calvin cycle, which is sometimes referred to as the dark reactions, occurs in the stroma because it is not directly using sunlight or the chlorophyll pigments. Okay, let's look at the light reactions. There's a lot going on in this figure. So let's take our time and, and look at it. So first of all, this membrane is one of those little thylakoid discs, right? So this is the interior of the disc in here, and this is outside in the stroma. Okay, light energy. We have two different photosystems, okay? Photosystems is essentially a reaction center which has the pigments in it, and this is where the sunlight's going to be harnessed. So 
this is one reaction or photosystem. This is another photosystem. This one's named photosystem two, named photosystem one, because that's the order in which they were discovered and named. Both of these photosystems is, is, is responsible for absorbing sunlight, right, and harnessing that energy. So let's, let's go through and see what happens. So sunlight comes in. These chlorophyll pigments, okay, are able to absorb that particular certain wavelengths of light from the sun. We'll talk about that, uh, the specific wavelengths in a minute. They absorb those wavelengths of the sun, and they are able to um, shuttle or concentrate the energy that they, dis that they absorb to this reaction center, okay, in this photosystem. The, the, the energy then is transferred to a pair of electrons, which go up in energy level, right? They're, they're gaining the energy, essentially, from sunlight, okay? Now, what happens to those electrons that have been energized? Well, they get passed down an electron transport chain. Same idea that we saw in cellular respiration, okay? So the, the high energy electron gets passed, passed, passed from one carrier to the next in this electron transport chain. And the same thing is, is accomplished. As the electrons are passed, and they give off a little energy, protons get pumped, okay, from one side of the membrane to the other. Now, um, let's stop right there for a second and, and, and just keep in mind that we have an electron that that hasn't, we haven't quite said what, what its final destination is, so just put that on hold, okay? Now, um, the other thing I want you to see, we had a pair of electrons, uh, excuse me, I just drew this backwards. This is the stroma out here, sorry. These electrons are being pumped this direction, okay? You can see the buildup of protons in the thylakoid space in here. Okay, excuse me about that. Now, back over here. We had electrons, right, that essentially got stripped from the reaction center, went up in energy level, and then they got passed down, and we end up with them here. We're, we're putting them on hold right here. But this reaction center now has to replace those electrons. Therefore, this is where plants produce oxygen. Electrons from water are taken to replace the electrons that shot up an energy level from sunlight. When you take electrons from water, you end up with oxygen gas. So it's in the light reactions that we see the production of oxygen. Okay, now I'm going to clear this off because this is getting really busy. Now we'll look at photosystem one and see what's happening. Same thing, sunlight is channeled, the energy from the sunlight is channeled by these chlorophyll pigments into the reaction center. That energy is transferred to a pair of electrons which, sh which shoot up an energy level. And this time, rather than getting passed down an electron transport chain, these, these electrons are transferred to NADP+ and it becomes NADPH. Now remember with cellular respiration we talked about NADH which was an electron carrier. NADPH is similar. What I want you to think about, yes it's an electron carrier, okay, and because it carries electrons, what are electrons? They are reducing, right, they can be reducing. So this NADPH is essentially reducing power, right, or potential. Whomever it drops these electrons off to is going to become reduced. And remember, in the overall reaction of photosynthesis, what are we doing? Well, we're reducing carbon dioxide into a sugar, into a glucose molecule. So we're going to need reducing power to do that. Now, here's what I want you to see. The electrons here, right, now have been delivered to NADP. So they have to be replaced by something. Well, what happens is this, these electrons that are ended up at the bottom of the electron transport chain from photosystem 2 replace the electrons 
that shot up an energy level from photosystem one. So what have we produced thus far? We produced NADPH. This is important. This is going to be needed by the Calvin cycle. In other words, the Calvin cycle's job is to make the glucose. The light reaction's job is to harness the sun's energy to produce what we need to make glucose later in the Calvin cycle. So we need basically two things in the Calvin cycle that, that the light reaction produce. We need NADPH, reducing power. We see where we get that. And we need ATP. We haven't produced, we haven't, I haven't shown you yet how the light reactions produce ATP, but we're about to do that. We've left off, we have our proton gradient, right? This is produced by the electron transport chain from the electrons that were energized by sunlight. Same process as cellular respiration. Protons cannot cross the membrane directly because they're charged. However, the ATP synthase molecule has a pore or channel that they flow through, turn that turnstile, and allow the enzyme to produce ATP. So again, to reiterate, the light reactions produce two things that are necessary for the Calvin cycle. NADPH, which is our reducing power, and ATP. So let's move on. Well, let's, let's go back and fill in some blanks, and then we'll go through the Calvin cycle. OK. We talked about the chloroplast. All right, where do the light reactions occur? OK, they occur, they occur in the thylakoid membrane. Because remember, we have those chlorophyll pigments that are necessary to absorb sunlight. The Calvin cycle occurs in the stroma. We haven't, we haven't gone through the details of that yet. So I want you to look at the structure of the chloroplast, which we did. We looked at the light reactions. We saw photosystem 1 and 2. OK. And the chlorophyll is the pigment that absorbs okay, energy from light or from sunlight. Now, we haven't talked about this yet. What color of light does the chlorophyll not absorb? So the way things work, I, you, things are either absorbing a certain wavelength of light or they're reflecting it. Okay, Something that appears a color appears that color to your eye because it is reflecting that color. So a red shirt is absorbing all the colors but red, it's reflecting red, that's why it looks red to you. So the chlorophyll pigments are absorbing the other colors of light that are not green, but they're not absorbing green light, they're reflecting green light. So. I want to show you one thing really quickly. So in light energy, okay, so this is, this is what we're showing you here is the visible region of light. You probably learned Roy G. Biv, right? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And it, it's showing you that light travels in wavelengths. The longer the wavelength, the lower the energy. The shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy. So the violet light has a shorter wavelength and the highest energy, whereas red has the longer wavelength and the least amount of energy. Now. Let's look at these chlorophyll molecules, OK? And actually, we've got chlorophyll A. It's one type of chlorophyll. And chlorophyll B is another pigment that they bo they're both chlorophyll pigments. They just absorb a little bit different range of the wavelengths of light. And then this third pigment here is, is beta carotene. This is what, so carrots or sweet potatoes, things that have orange coloration, this is the pigment that causes them to look look that way. Here are all the wavelength of light in nanometers. This is just in their wavelength, right? How long or short their wavelength is. But it shows you the colors of them. So um, it's we start violet, 
and, and go the opposite way. So Roy G. Biv the opposite way. So you can see chlorophyll A is the solid line. You can see that as it goes up, this is the amount of light it's absorbing. And you see in the green range, we get like no absorption. It starts to go up for orange and yellow. Chlorophyll B, again, it's way down in the green, doesn't absorb any. Okay. Beta carotene has a little bit different uh, range. Notice that it does absorb in the green wavelength. It appears orange, so it doesn't absorb any light in the orange range, and then it absorbs again. Oh, no, that, that's uh, chlorophyll B. So then it, it doesn't absorb the rest of the wavelengths of light. Okay, so this walks you through what we looked at, the details of all of the light reactions, okay? The ATP in light reactions is produced from the proton gradient, right, that was, that was created by way of the electron transport chain. So, and, and then it talks about photosystem one there. Everything that's happened, remember we get our NADPH from photosystem one. Um, and this is the details about the production of ATP. Hydrogen moves down their concentration gradient and an enzyme called ATP synthase produces ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. Last topic of the night is the Calvin cycle, sometimes referred to as the dark reactions, okay? It doesn't have to occur in the dark, it just means this particular reaction is, it does not directly make use of light. Now, it is dependent on the product of the light reactions. Remember, the light reactions produced ATP and they produced NADPH, which are going to be needed in the Calvin cycle, okay? Here's the Calvin cycle. A few things I want to point out to you. First is, for every glucose molecule, we actually need six molecules of CO2, right? There are six carbons in glucose, therefore we would need six CO2s. But what I want you to see is, what, what this process is generating is something called G3P, okay, or GA3P, that's, that has three carbons. It takes two GA3Ps to make one molecule of glucose. So three CO2s make one GA3P. Six CO2s would make two of these, which would equal one full molecule of glucose. Okay. This enzyme Rubisco is very important because it does what we call carbon fixation. Okay. And what that means is it fixes or bonds this carbon dioxide, which is a gas, onto a sugar molecule, okay? So, again, like we saw with the, Cal uh, with, uh, the Krebs cycle, we have a molecule that we're going to essentially, or not we, Rubisco is going to bond a molecule of CO2 onto, okay? So, this is a one, two, three, four, five carbon molecule. Add a CO2 on and, you'll, and you get a six carbon molecule, okay? Um, that six carbon molecule will rearrange and you will have six molecules of a three carbon compound. Now I want to make sure we understand that it seems a little complicated and you don't have to remember all these details, but I want you to see that all the carbons of glucose are going to be coming from CO2. So we started with three molecules of this five carbon compound. So this was 15 carbons here. Three CO2s, that's plus three, would be 18 carbons. So these 18 carbons, right, all came from either RUBP or CO2. Now here's where you, you see the necessary products from the light reactions. ATP is needed and NADPH is needed to make six of these GA3P molecules. Okay, so we had 18 carbons. Six times three is still 18, so we've still got 18 carbons here. Three of the carbons come out right here, okay? 
for one molecule of GA3P. All three of these carbons came from the three molecules of carbon dioxide. The rest of this process is just regenerating. So 18 minus 3 would be 15, right? Is just regenerating the 15 carbon molecule that we hitched a ride on at the beginning. So key takeaway points need ATP, need an ADPH. Rubisco is an important enzyme because it fixes carbon dioxide into this process. And every single carbon of glucose comes from a carbon in carbon dioxide, right? That's, that's, and that's what the reaction told us, that carbon dioxide gets reduced into glucose. Okay, lastly, so yes, we saw carbon dioxide fixation by a special enzyme called Rubisco. And we saw that carbon dioxide got reduced into what? Into glucose, which there's a there was an intermediary we talked at about, right? GO3P, but ultimately it gets reduced into glucose. We saw that NADPH and ATP were necessary in order to reduce CO2 into glucose or into the sugar. And the final part of the process was just regenerating that fifth, that RUBP that we essentially hitched a ride on from the beginning. Um, ignore this last question. All I want you to, I want you to make the connection that every carbon of glucose, so glucose has six carbons, right? All six of these carbons came from a molecule of carbon dioxide. So we, we have to have six CO2s for every one glucose that's produced in the Calvin cycle.